That's impissening. You are. I'm listening to first Nathan ever. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another installment, which means we are in a stall today. Oh, excuse me. Of <laughs> the second worst marathon ever. As opposed to that. Well, I won't go into that. <laughs> yeah, we have beaten that horse long after it had died. Uh, this is Rish Outfield, by the way. And I'm Big Anklovich. Welcome back, folks. And for us, it's been months since the last episode. But for you, it's been a day. Is yeah, that correct? Just, just since yesterday. Time travel exists, kids. It's so cool. Despite Brandon it. Lincoln's assertions. So what we, what are we doing? We're doing we the are... greatest DreamWorks fart jokes ever. Yeah, and we're at number 16 now. And uh, the, the uh, answer to that one is the fart gun salute given by the minions to Dr. Nefario in Despicable Me 2. Could I hear a sample of that, please? I think they were... <laughs> Those minions. They never get old. <laughs> they don't. They. I think they've been around since the beginning of time. <laughs> old me. Uh, no, what are we really doing? It's something that Pixar related, right? Yeah... Yeah. Uh, we are doing the Pixar Rules of Storytelling. Today we are at number 16. The Minion Fart Gun Salute is the rule. Every show must include a Minion Fart Gun Salute. No. Uh, rule number 16 is... What are the stakes? Give us a reason to root for the character. What happens if they don't succeed? Stack the odds against. It just stops it against. I'm just going to go ahead and put them on there. Yeah, you know, I, I, I second that. Motion passes. Them. That feels like two things to me. It does? One is because you, you said establish the stakes if they fail. But the other one is stack the odds against them. Doesn't that feel like two different things? Well, I guess. I think they're just saying establish the stakes and make them big. Still talking about stakes. Okay. Well, then I don't understand. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I don't. I, I, to me, those are totally different things. One is make it very hard for your protagonist to achieve their goal. Okay. But the other is... Make there be danger, make there be a threat, make there be consequences if they fail. Those, yeah, to me, the are different Yeah, the consequences seems like what the stakes are. Like, what's the stakes? It's the end of the world! Which, maybe Wally, that was the stakes? But I don't think The world was... had already ended, hadn't it? Yeah, but they weren't going to be able to restart it, so it would stay ended. Okay. Yeah, the, mostly Pixar doesn't have end of the world kind of stakes, because they tend to... Have more localized stories? I don't know. When your story's about toys, their stories are more intimate. World. And you know what? I think that's part of why those are better movies than those. You know, we talk about escalating scope on these superhero movies. Right. And how it's just like, it's not enough that the woman he loves might get killed or that, you know, a building might blow up or that the president will be shot or whatever it is. It has to be the whole world. And then in the next movie, well, you know, it's not enough that it's the whole world. Yeah, not just... anymore. They did that last time. Now it's the whole, the whole universe. universe. I, and then what do you do? I posit that intimate, small stakes that you care about are way more important than massive, gigantic stakes that are just sort of vague or, that, you know, that you're not emotionally invested in. I think it's hard to imagine the entire world hanging in the balance. But it's easy to think of your family is in danger or your best friend is going to die or, I mean, make it even smaller. You are going to die or your whole purpose for living is going to be over. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. I, but that's, that's just my opinion. I mean, if we take Incredibles, since it's the most superhero of all of those movies, and let's talk about what the stakes are. 
Well, the stakes do... Uh, it seems like at first it's the family. And that's probably the biggest stakes that are there the whole time. They do eventually send that robot to the big city. And it's tearing apart the big city. So the big city could be destroyed. Do they have a name for that city? I can't remember. But, I just assumed it was San Francisco, but... but they, Okay, so they, def, but they defeat the robot together... And then Syndrome is still out there, and he's gone, and he's taken their child. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, I think the stakes become smaller, but they become more intimate. Yeah. And in, uh, in their other films, the stakes are... Uh, Andy won't have his favorite toys anymore. That's twice, right? Because Woody's going to get taken off to Japan or whatever. He won't have Andy anymore. Or his friends, I guess. But in the first movie, yeah, especially Woody, but Woody and Buzz are going to lose Andy. I guess there's the stakes of, you know, what Sid going to do. But overall, it's like we got to get back to Andy. We got, we, Bugs Life has a pretty big scope of what the stakes are. I mean, it's, it's, it's essentially slavery. And that looms over the ants. You know, the, the grasshoppers do this and they, they take and they take and they take. And this year, I think that they they produced they underproduced how much food they could give to the grasshoppers, right? Well, they produced it and then accidentally dumped it in the water because of Flick. So, yeah. Okay, but what 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 do the stakes become when they dump that in the water? The, the grasshoppers come down and say, "You've got to get us all that food," and it's kind of like the collapse of their ant colony, I suppose, because. They won't have food for themselves anymore because they're going to have to give all the food that they would give themselves, you know, keep for themselves for the winter. Now they have to give that to the grasshoppers and they won't have anything for themselves. And there is a point where they say, oh yeah, we're going to take this stuff and then we're going to squish the queen. And I guess that's high stakes for ants anyways. Well, it's their mother, yeah, right? It's it's, Or if you're from... A country that has a queen, that means something. I don't know, but do, what, you're right. Yeah, they, they were going to squash the queen because the ants had gotten uppity. But there was no threat that the grasshoppers would kill the ants or eat the ants? Or... I don't think it was so much a threat of that as that they would just leave them there to starve, which is sort of the same thing. Okay, well, but starvation is pretty big stakes. But I guess we're also looking at stack the odds against them? Is that what it was? Yes. And see, to me, that's the one that you can do something about. Where you you could take something that you've written and say, you know, how do I... And of course, I guess you can take the stakes and say, you know, how do I make these stakes more... What's the word I'm looking for? More... Large. Larger. Well, not just large, but that they mean more. That they're... The, they're the, it's, it's much more hangs in the balance than currently does. Uh-huh. But yeah, the, the odds being against them is something that I really respond to. I think, I think everybody does in storytelling. Everybody likes the story of an underdog. Everybody likes the story of somebody who is told that they can't do something or, or by all rights shouldn't be allowed to do something, but they persevere. They find a way to do it anyway. Yeah, we went to a comic book convention not too long ago where we went to a panel where they talked about Steven Spielberg, George Lucas... And their cohort, or whatever you want to call it. The movies that they produced or directed, or I guess somehow had a hand in. I'm not sure exactly what. They included an awful lot of movies in it. It was basically like every movie from the 80s. Um, <laughs> right, but except for Princess Bride, they were all Steven Spielberg or George Lucas movies, right? Yeah. Anyways, they talked about one of the things that they figured the reason why all of them were so successful is they always had a really every man kind of protagonist. They were always not powerful, not special. There was no reason that they should be able to do the things that they did. But they faced the odds and continued trying until they managed to succeed, basically. Well, don't you really respond to that? I, yeah. I love that. I love that where it's just... I guess it's the anti-chosen one idea, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. Where it's just an ordinary person, or it's a... Gosh, what's what's the opposite of extraordinary? I know you're going to say ordinary, but 
somebody who's not special, somebody who doesn't stick out, somebody you wouldn't pick first for your team or any of that stuff, and yet they are the ones that can make the difference or have to make the difference. Below or, average. Yeah. I, I, I really respond to that. And, you know, they used examples of, like, Roy Scheider being the, the sheriff, but he's afraid of the water. He's He lives in a little town where nothing ever happens. Kind of thing. He's not macho. He's not powerful. And What, what does he know, say on... Uh... Very home companion about Lake Wobegon. These are all better than that, though. He says all the w- women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average, or something like that. Sorry, that just came to mind. I forget I ever spoke and move on with what you're saying about Roy Scheider. Well, no, I told you that my friend said there's only one podcast that's worth listening to, folks. And I was like, oh, wow, he's going to. And that's Lake Wobegon Tales by Garrison <laughs> Keeler. I was like, oh. Well, no, I just uh, that was one example. I mean, they used other examples from those movies. I, you know, like Sean Astin in Goonies, where he's the weakling with the aspirator. What do you call it? Is it an aspirator? I think it is called an aspirator. You know, the asthma, and you know, he's short, and you know, he's going to be fat in the Lord of the Rings. You know, he's just he's got that. Yeah, somebody's going to be a stacked, fat little Samwise. Decks are stacked against him, and yet you know he is the main character in that story. I like that, and. I don't think we're really in that era so much anymore because it's usually like, okay, let's find some perfect looking CW star, <laughs> right? That we yeah. can have star in this or they have to be good at everything or, you know. It's or maybe, do you think that's the chosen one thing? Does it come from like the Matrix and Harry Potter and every single... Even the freaking Star Wars prequels were like, you're the chosen one. You were supposed to bring balance in the Force. Did they ever talk? They didn't talk about that in the first three Star Wars, did they? No, there was no, cho- there was no chosen, chosen one. Or any one. Of that stuff. But why did that? See, that should have everything. worked though. That should have worked because they were building him up to be the savior, and he ended up being whatever the opposite of a savior is—the destroyer. You know, that should have worked. I remember when I saw that in the previews. You know. Ewan McGregor almost has emotion when he's delivering that line. And, and I was like, oh, this is going to be good. But it's the line is sh- oh, so shitty. You were the chosen one. You were supposed to bring balance to the force, not plunge it into, into darkness. darkness. Anakin should have said, I did bring balance to the force. Now there's only one Sith and one Jedi. The end. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. But yeah, the, the chosen one thing has come up again and again and again. And it's fine because everybody's had a chosen one in in a story that they liked or religions always have chosen ones and things like that. And it's so easy to just say, well, this guy was prophesied to fix things and so he will. Yeah, you don't have to. I'm so tired of that, though. It seems like it's in just everything. There's somebody that was prophesied. There was always a prophecy. And they I turned love... uh, Peter Parker into that in those Amazing Spider-Man movies, remember? Uh, I love that they at least... With the Lego movie, when they had the prophecy, <laughs> they kind of turned it on its head and just said, yeah, I made it up. I, it's one of those self-fulfilling prophecies, you know, where I figured once I say you're the special one, then you'll become the special one because I said it. It's true because it rhymes. <laughs> um, I'm just, it's, that's, I've, I've actually had a few ideas for stories recently and I thought, oh yeah, and there could be prophecy about this. And then I went, no, damn it, no. There will not be a prophecy. There's got to be some other way to do this because that sucks. It's so tired and so I'm sick of it. It's been done really, really well. Like Harry Potter is a perfect example, but it's also so overdone. Yeah. That, yeah, it's probably better not to attempt it. I mean, if you can just avoid the whole chosen one idea altogether. I mean, but I think what you're doing in the gauntlet, I mean, if you do it, Ooh, this is going to sound condescending as hell. Should I say it? <laughs> you didn't say it. If you do it right. you do right, it as good as I do it. <laughs> if you do it right, you set up this certain character as the one that's supposed to be it. That you're like, okay, we, we have a savior. He's right here, ladies and gentlemen. He's everything you're expecting. Come on out. And then yeah, that gets turned on its ear, you know? And, but that doesn't have to be what you do with it. It's just when you pitched it to me, I was just like, oh... Okay, oh, wow, that's cool. I haven't seen that. And so, um, I'm sorry, but we were talking about the the, uh, the odds being stacked against them. 
Now, the other time that we went to a comic book convention, was it the comic book convention? It was. That's where, all we ever go to. No, I was just because you also went to that sim writers symposium thing I did. where you got a lot. But I'm pretty sure it was the comic book convention where we were t- watching the writers and they were talking about the. Yeah, you know, the guy has a problem, and then he goes, and he does something, and he solves it, and it's over. That's, That's a, a short, short story. story, but if he has to try five different things to solve, then you've got a novel. I it believe seemed that was like Dave that, Wolverton. That yeah, and it seemed like that kind of meant something more to you when you heard it at this particular time than any other time, and you were just like, man, I need to do that with my sequel to Birth of a Sidekick. And so you killed him. <laughs> and it was in the first death, page. The death of a sidekick, sadly. See, that's such um, a good title. I wish I could use that. <laughs> well, you can as... eventually. I mean, you don't want to do it, obviously, in the first sequel. You got to give them a little chance. But <laughs> I just, yeah, the I... life of a sidekick. At least I have that portion of the story. <laughs> <laughs> we have talked about that. Yes, the odds being stacked against them. I mean, what he was talking about was putting obstacles to keep them from getting what they wanted and and when i was thinking about that story that i had in my mind i was just like okay well what joss whedon like awfulness can i have happen to this (laughs) character and so yeah it basically became okay what can i give him so that i can take it away (laughs) which is so cruel but that's what drama is made from is is to give you a reason to care or to give somebody something so that you feel its absence when it's gone yeah, it makes me think of, like, for example, book three of Harry Potter, where, I mean, obviously since the beginning, Harry Potter has just wanted a family that cares about him, a family that won't make him live in the cupboard under the stairs while his brother has two rooms, one for himself and then one for the crap that he doesn't want to keep in his other room kind of a thing. And at last in book three, there's serious. And Sirius is his godfather, he discovered, and Sirius wants him to come and live with him. And Sirius was his father's best friend. And Sirius really likes Harry just because, if nothing else, he looks like his best friend that is now dead. And he misses and he wants to be able to give Harry everything. And then, in the end, it all goes awry and he's not able to have any of that. See, yeah, that was my favorite of the seven books. And... I remember when I got to that point being so happy for Harry because, I, you know, I read these before they were movies. I thought, you know, he's going to get taken away from the damned Dursleys. And he's finally going to, you know, he's like Harry deserves a good life. And that, and when it's taken away, yeah, it's worse that he has to go back to the Dursleys. You know what I mean? It's just uh-huh. like, oh, no. And people do this all the time because the Star Wars trilogy is, is kind of a religion and and, you know, it's it's no fun if you can't tear down somebody else's religion. But people will talk about how much of a big deal Luke Skywalker made about the death of Ben Kenobi. And do you remember who was it that posted this thing just the other day? But he's just like, oh, Luke is all broken up over a guy he met 10 minutes ago. And yet, you know, his aunt and uncle are burned alive in front of his eyes and he doesn't even blink. And A, that's friggin' horseshit. But two... Obi-Wan represented that same thing to Luke, that he could be taken away from the mundane prison that his life had become. You know, he'd seen his friends move on and go off and have their adventures or or start their lives, at least. And he was stuck where he had been his whole life in a dead end on a dead end world, not just in a dead end town or whatever. We don't really know what Uncle Ben and Aunt Beru were like, but you get the impression that they dangled this carrot in front of him. Of, yeah, you can go to the academy or you can go leave, you can go start your life. But it kept getting pushed into the future farther and farther until Luke was, you know, he despaired. We see him look at the suns and you can just imagine what's going through his head. But I imagine that it's just like, I'm never going to leave. I'm never going to be anything. I'm never going to be anybody. We don't know how old Luke is. Those prequels didn't happen, so he's not 18. He could be 24 and he's still stuck on this desert planet with no way to escape. And then this guy comes along and says, you are the son of somebody who was super powerful and influential. And he was a warrior. And it's like, and you have the potential to do that too. Why don't you come with me and we'll have adventures together? I'm too old to do it by myself. I need you. 
and this whole universe opens up to Luke that we're going to go and we're going to make a difference in the world against the empire and I'm going to be somebody in that. And then that guy is killed in front of him, in before his eyes. Of course, you're, you know, everything is dashed. What does Luke have? He has nothing. He's, he hasn't got a cent to yeah. his name. He sold his land speeder, for goodness sake. He's not even on his own world. He's in the middle of nowhere on a... On the friggin' Death Star. Be lucky to get off alive, etc. Yeah, it's and so, so that's that's kind of what I read into it. I mean, of course, I maybe I sound like an apologist or whatever, but that's what I see into Luke's despair when Ben is gone. It's like I was gonna be that. I, I don't even know what a Jedi is, but he said I could be it, and now. What if he was the last one? What if, no, what if no one else knows what he knew? Or what if there's nobody else that's alive that knew my father that can tell me what he was like? You know, all of these doors have been closed when this evil guy in black kills your new... I mean, Obi-Wan, was he not just a new father figure that came into Luke's life? And it's just like, you're special. I care about you. Come with me. Anyhow, I, I don't know how we got... Oh, it's just ta giving somebody something only to take it away. And... Uh, I guess that's that's what I was talking about. Or, but, you know, just the odds being stacked against you. I think that also the odds being stacked against you is goes back to that, you know, Spielberg slash Lucas thing that we were talking about where the hero is not the stud. The hero is the, the nerd or the weakling, the person that doesn't have everything. And... He has to go up against something that would be daunting to the stud or the, the non, the, whatever, the smartest guy. I guess nerds are smart, so that's not a good opposite. I'm trying to, what's the opposite of the cool guy? Whatever. <laughs> the person that's the opposite of what your hero is would still be daunted by these odds. And instead, we, we've got this utter weakling that has to take on these odds. Well, to go back to Luke. Stacking them against Han him. is the stud. Right. And Han says attacking that space station is more like suicide. He's afraid to do it. And yet Luke, who's a nobody, is going to go up and risk his life to stop this thing. It'd be just like shooting womp rats at home. <laughs> okay, but a guy <laughs> who I'm assuming has fake wedge. Who says that line? That's impossible, even for a computer. Fake Wedge, we assume, has been piloting X-Wings for years. And he says it's impossible. And look who's never even been behind the wheel of one. It has to try. I, I don't know. It, Do it, they have a wheel? <laughs> it has a... I, it's, it's a wheel, right? What would you call wheel? that? A steering know. mechanism of some sort? Handlebars? You know what Vader has? You know, it's, that looks like a steering wheel in, on the TIE a, Fighters. Uh, just a controller, like like a PlayStation. PlayStation. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's that sort of thing, but it was before it's those It's got existed. a cord attached to it, and you can just... <laughs> All right. Anyway, I guess we could. I could talk about Star Wars for hours and hours. We but should we're play. supposed to be talking Pixar, so I'm going to cut you I'm off. sorry. <laughs> you have a podcast for talking Star Wars, I... and it's not this one. You know, this... People this, should listen to that one. Though. This really is the second worst marathon ever, after all. Okay, well, give me the stakes and the obstacles in Newt, okay? Uh, yeah, so... Oh, wait, Newt? Okay, so we're going to call it a day with this one, and uh, we'll see you again tomorrow when we come back with another Rule of Pixar. Good night. Thanks for listening, everybody. At the Dune Steve, we pay our authors as well as our own bills for the website maintenance and the like, so if you're ever in a generous mood, or even if you're not, we'd love it if you donate. Just press the button on the website to donate $5 a month, a quarter, or choose your own one-time donation amount. That Gets My Goat is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, meaning share it with everyone, but don't sell it or change it.